Uh, hello. So if you're looking for the video for the Popple 2021 submission titled Functorial Semantics for Partial Theories, good, you're in the right place, and that's what this is. Uh, so that's, of course, the title. And uh, the authors are, well, there are four of us. I am Chad Nestor. Um, I'm a PhD student at Tallinn University of Technology. Um, I'm supervised by Pavel Sobaczynski, who is also a co-author on this paper. Um, Fosco Laregin is also a co-author and is a postdoc in our group in Tallinn. And uh, we also worked on this with Ivan de Liberty um, from the Czech Academy of Sciences. <laughs> and what this talk is about is partial universal algebra. So this is sort of the syntax and semantics of algebraic theories, but where the operations in your algebraic theory are partial instead of total by default. <clears throat> and the way we're going to get there is by, so to start off, we're going to talk about just algebraic theories and a bit about universal algebra in, in the classical sense. So this is things like groups and rings and monoids and so on. And um, universal algebra turns out to have a lot to do, in this sense, turns out to have a lot to do with categories with finite products. And um, the, the way we're going to get from total maps to partial maps is to take the string diagrams for finite products and sort of modify them to get instead string diagrams for partial maps. So after we talk about universal algebra and algebraic theories, we'll talk about the string diagrams for finite products and then how we change them to get string diagrams for partial maps. Um, so once we do that, we'll, we'll give a couple of partial algebraic theories using these string diagrams for partial maps. And then we'll talk about um, what sorts of things you can capture using this string diagrammatic syntax for partial maps. Um, that's the variety theorem. <clears throat> so just um, algebraic theories, I'm sure we've all seen things like this. Where, for example, we, we have the theory of commutative monoids given by a signature. In this case, our signature has two operations. Um, one is sort of multiplication. It takes two things and gives me back one thing. And uh, the other one is uh, the, the sort of unit of the multiplication, which is a constant. So it takes in zero things and gives me back one thing. And these are intended to be understood as total functions, but right now they're just syntax. And uh, then in the theory of commutative monoids, we subject these to the following equations that uh, x1 times x2 times x3 is x1 times x2 times x3, it's associativity, of course, um, that um, x1 times x2 is x2 times x1, because it's a commutative monoid, and uh, then the unit equation, that x1 times our unit E is just x1. So that's, that's the theory of monoids that I, we all sort of know and love. And... Whenever you have a theory like this, given by a signature and equations between terms over that signature, like we just saw, a good way to think about it is in terms of the sort of category of terms that it defines. So the objects of this category of terms are just natural numbers. And the arrows in this category of terms, say from n to m, are going to be m tuples of terms in n variables modulo the equations of the theory, like the equations of commutative monoids. Uh, so the idea is that I have my m tuple of terms, and uh, there's say t1 through tm, and each of these terms ti is in free variables x1 through xn sort of at most. It doesn't have to use all of them. And it can use them twice and so on. <clears throat> terms, you know. And then uh, to compose these terms in our category, we, we've just performed substitution um, in, in a sense that should become clear on the next slide when we do an example. So yes, so for example, in our theory of commutative monoids, we, we could just take um, our, our generators, the, uh, the things in our signature, and make uh, one tuples of terms where we just apply them to variables. So I could get the one tuple of x1 times x2, which because it's in two variables, is a term from two to one in my category of terms. Uh, and then for the constant e, well, um, I could have the one tuple of just e, which is, of course, a term in zero variables, so I get a morphism from zero to one in my category of terms. Mm. Um, something slightly more complicated, I could have a two tuple of terms, this, this one on the second line here, 
where um, in, in this case I have x1 times x2 times x1 and x1. And then both of these are terms in two variables, and there are two of them. So that's a morphism from two to two in my category of terms. So it's, it's not so hard. And then um, I said that composition was by substitution, and we'll do an example of that. If I take my term, my, my two tuple here, my term of type, sorry, my arrow of type two to two, and I compose it with my arrow of type two to one, just given by my, my sort of times operator, um, well, then I should get a, a term of type two to one. And um, the, the way it's defined is, well, we substitute the first thing in the sort of first tuple in the composition, in this case, x1 times x2 times x1, for x1, the first variable, in all the terms in the second thing. And similarly, we substitute the second thing in the, the tuple in sort of the first part of the composite for the second variable in all the terms in the second part of the composite. It's a bit of a mouthful, but um, you, you can sort of work out what it is by looking at this example, hopefully. <clears throat> and uh, a very important thing about this category is that it always has finite products, where the product on objects is just you take two numbers and you add them together to get the product. And on arrows, well, if I have, um, <clears throat> Yeah, so an n tuple of terms and an n tuple of terms say, well, then I can take their direct product by, or their Cartesian product by just sort of squishing them together, concatenating that list of terms into one big list of terms. <clears throat> and that's going to be important in a minute because finite products are sort of um, characteristic of these algebraic theories. Um, right, so then once I have this category of terms for my, my sort of theory of monoids or my theory of whatever, then I can talk about models. Uh, and a model of a theory, like the theory of monoids, is a functor from this category of terms to the category of sets uh, that preserves finite products, because of course set also has finite products. And um, if we work this out, then we find that, for example, models of our theory of commutative monoids are exactly the commutative monoids, <laughs> which is good, that's, that's what we would want. So this is sort of a, a good notion of models so far. And then um, in addition to models, of course, we can have model morphisms where models are functors from the category of terms to set and model morphisms are just natural transformations between those functors. And uh, for the theory of commutative monoids, well, we remember that models are commutative monoids and it turns out that model morphisms are exactly the monoid homomorphisms between those. Uh, and so that's very nice. We can sort of capture the category of commutative monoids and a whole bunch of other categories besides as models and model morphisms of these theories. And uh, we, we call categories that arise this way varieties. So that, that's why the thing we'll talk about later is called a variety theory. <clears throat> so we, we've seen a bit that um, these, these algebraic theories have a lot to do with categories with finite products. And categories with finite products have another sort of presentation in terms of symmetric monoidal categories. Uh, in particular, if I have a symmetric monoidal category where for every object I have a copying map, uh, as you see on the top here, so, so we sort of read this from top to bottom. This is a map that takes in um, an X and gives me two X's. And in particular, it's going to give me, the, the idea is that it's going to give me two of the X I got in. <clears throat> and uh, so the copying map satisfies an equation that says it sort of works well with maps and actually copies them like we see up here on the right. And uh, the other thing that categories with finite products have in this view is deleting maps for all of their objects. So this is a map that takes in an X and gives me back nothing, um, sort of deletes the X. And then we also insist, like for copying, that these satisfy an equation saying that they, you know, they actually do delete things. <clears throat> and uh, so the, the structure like the, that um, captures how copying and deleting interact in categories with finite products is called a commutative co-monoid. Um, the idea is that if I copy something and then swap the copies, um, well, that's the same as just copying the thing. So it's sort of co-commutative. And um, if I copy something and get rid of one of the copies, that's the identity. And uh, that copying is associative. And then we also ask for some coherence conditions, but we won't worry about them right now. And so that's, that's a very good way to think about categories with finite products. And one 
thing we can do with these sort of string diagrams for categories with finite products is take the terms in, for example, our theory of commutative monoids uh, by writing the generators like so. So we take the, the times operation and we'll write it as this thing that takes, well, two things and gives me their multiplication back out on the bottom. And uh, the unit will write as something that takes in nothing because it's a constant and gives me, well, the unit out on the bottom. Uh, and then we can form, well, we can write the terms of our theory as string diagrams. Uh, so for example, if I wanted to write x1 times x2 times x1, then, uh, then I could do that as sort of as this string diagram, where the variables come in the top. So the one on the left is x1, and the one on the right is x2. And then I see sort of that I copy x1, so I'm going to use it twice, which makes sense because it occurs twice in the term. And then I apply x1 to x2, and then I apply the result, I times x1 by x2, and then I times the result of that by x1 to get my term coming out the bottom. And that's sort of the idea. That's sort of how you can use um, string diagrams for Cartesian monoidal categories, the ones with finite products, uh, to describe terms in your algebraic theories. <clears throat> Um, but of course, I've promised you partial algebraic theories, and uh, we want the operations there to be partial functions, not total functions. And um, th this is sort of a problem. We, we can, <laughs> it doesn't work very well um, if you just try to use finite products and the finite product structure to do this, because we'd like our models to be in the category par of sets and partial functions instead of the category set of sets and total functions. Um, and the, the problem is that par doesn't have finite products. So this sort of classical syntax corresponding to finite products thing that we've been talking about means that uh, we're not really gonna be able to use our, our classical syntax to describe partial algebraic theories uh, because it's not gonna work out in par. There is nothing to send um, deleting in particular to in par. <clears throat> Uh, so what are we going to use instead? You know, we, we need some syntax to describe partial maps. And um, the, the approach we're going to take to developing that syntax is looking at what structure like copying and deleting does par have in terms of string diagrams. And then that's the structure that we'll use to formalize our partial maps, you know, choosing wisely. And uh, the structure that par has that we're going to use is, uh, well, first copying, just like um, categories with finite products. Um, and it also has restriction, which is a lot like deletion, but doesn't satisfy that deletion equation. And we'll talk a bit more about what this means in a few slides, um, but we, we draw it the same way as deletion, but it's important to remember that it doesn't satisfy that equation. So um, in par, restriction is sort of the, the total map that sends everything in a set to the only thing in the terminal object, which is, or the, the restriction terminal object, which is just the, the sort of one element set. Um, copying, of course, just copies things. Uh, and then another very important bit of structure that's present in par is a sameness function, um, which so it takes in two things of the same type. And if they're the same thing, returns that thing and is undefined otherwise. So this is certainly something we don't have in sets, say, because it's a partial function, but it's like a, an equality test. And we'll draw it as copying upside down and we're gonna use it. And uh, the, the sort of the structure, the way that these structures interact and the properties they satisfy are a lot like um, categories with finite products where copying and restriction form a commutative co-monoid, just like before. So the same equations we had a few slides ago for copying and restriction, except there it was copying and deletion. Um, the sameness is commutative and dissociative uh, because of course, if X and Y are the same, then Y and X are the same. And if X and Y and Z are the same, it doesn't really matter which order I find that out in. Um, and then the way that copying and sameness interact, sort of algebraically like this, is that they are special Frobenius, um, which means that if I copy something, then the two copies had better be the same. That's the special equation on the left here. Uh, and that they satisfy the Frobenius equation, which is uh, a bit difficult to get your mouth around if you try to explain it in words, but it's just another thing that copying and um, sameness must satisfy. And in fact, it goes a lot of the way to characterizing when something is a copying slash sameness operator. And we ask for some coherence conditions like before, but again, we're not gonna talk about it right now. Um, before we move on, I'll just spend uh, a second talking about restriction again. Um, and so, so because we don't have that deleting axiom, which would make this just equal to you know, the, the deletion of and without F, 
um, this map where I do f and then the restriction map. It, it corresponds the, to the domain of definition of f, because f is a partial map. It's only defined on part of its domain, and that part is the domain of definition. And an important consequence of the domain of definition arising as a map is that we can sort of insist that two maps have the same domain of definition equationally. In particular, if I, if I have my equation here on the bottom, that sort of f restrict is equal to g and restrict, well, that, that equation expresses that the partial maps f and g have the same domain of definition, which is going to be very useful. Uh, and, and so if we have a symmetric modal category with, with this structure, so with copying and restriction and deletion that's well behaved, as we've just seen on the previous slides, uh, well, we're, we're going to call that symmetric monoidal category a partial algebraic theory. Um, so sort of, um, in the same way that sometimes people call categories with finite products algebraic theories for their correspondence to the syntax of classical terms. And then a model of one of these partial algebraic theories is a symmetric monoidal functor, so it preserves the monoidal structure, um, f from the category of, well, from this category, my partial algebraic theory x, to the category of sets and partial functions uh, that preserves the copying and restriction and sameness. So it has to map the copying in x to the copying in par, the restriction in x to the restriction in par, and sameness to sameness. <clears throat> And then um, the notion of model morphism that it turns out we want is uh, lax transformations instead of natural transformations. Uh, and a lax transformation is almost the same thing as a natural transformation. Um, so if I have my, my two models, f and g, of some partial algebraic theory x, then a lax transformation from f to g is like a natural transformation, a family of um, maps in par indexed by the objects of x, the partial theory, with the property that for any map in x, I, I get this naturality square commuting up to inequality, where this inequality is the extension ordering in par. Uh, so what that is, is if you take partial functions and think of them as relations, namely subsets of the domain times the codomain, um, then extension is the subset relation there. <clears throat> So it's, it's like a sort of common thing when you work with uh, partial maps. So that's a bit confusing, but we'll give examples, so don't worry. And the first example we'll give of a partial algebraic theory is the theory of separation algebras. And uh, this is going to be the free monoidal category with copying and deletion and restriction. So the, wait, sorry, copying and restriction and sameness, whoops. <laughs> um, generated by, um, two sort of generating morphisms. This is sort of our signature and a bunch of equations. And um, so a separation algebra is a partial commutative monoid that is cancellative. And the generators for the partial monoid structure are what we see sort of in the top left here where I'm hovering the mouse, where the monoid operation is of course the one that takes in two arguments and gives out one argument or one result, I suppose. And the unit of the partial monoid is this one that takes in nothing and outputs one thing. In particular, that's going to be the unit. Uh, and we'll ask um, that the domain of definition of the unit is the whole one element set. That's sort of the effect of this, this equation here with the sort of barbell being equal to nothing. Where we're asking that the unit map is total, which is something you need for this to make sense. Uh, but we're not going to ask that the monoid operation is total. So it might be the case that um, I, I sort of multiply two things together with the monoid operation and that that's undefined, which is something to keep in mind. Um, and then we ask for the normal equations of a commutative monoid. We ask that it's associative, which is this here. We ask that it's unital, and we ask that it's commutative of the monoid operation, which is this stuff sort of on the left. Um, and so models of that are going to be partial commutative monoids, which is nice. Um, and then to get from partial commutative monoids to separation algebras, we add one more axiom. Uh, and it's a bit confusing, but um, what it says, we'll, we'll sort of read it together, is that if I take the thing on the first wire here on the left, and I times it by the thing on the second wire, and then I also times it by the thing on the third wire, and those two things are the same, 
So yep, they're in the domain of definition of the sameness operation. Um, well, then the thing on the second and third wire had to be the same anyway. And in fact, that's if and only if, because this is an equation. And uh, so that's how we express the cancellativity property in our syntax as an equation. Um, and so that's, yeah. Now, models of the theory are, of course, separation algebras, um, as you'd expect. And uh, model morphisms turn out to be the, the right notion of morphism between partial monoids. So they, they preserve the unit on the nose, and um, they, they sort of do the right thing to the times operation, the operation of the monoid. And this is a bit tricky, um, because we have this inequality here instead of just inequality. Uh, and what it says, the way we would read it, is that, um, well, if A times B is defined, then F of A times F of B is defined, and F of A times B is F of A times F of B. Um, and of course, that's the right notion of um, sort of preserving a partial operation. The, the thing that could go wrong is that, um, like if this was equal, then f of a times f of b being defined would imply that a times b was defined, which is not always the case. Anyway, we'll, we'll move on a bit. Um, another example that I quite like of something that you can do with this uh, approach to partial theories is the theory of categories. Um, we're going to sneakily introduce sorted theories here, but uh, the idea is the same. It's just that your wires have sort annotations now, and you can only connect two wires with the same sort when you compose the morphisms in your category. Um, so what, what does a category have? Well, it has two sorts corresponding to two generating objects for our category of sort of partial terms, the, the monoidal thing. Um, it's going to have an object A of arrows and an object O of objects the sort of arrows and the sort of objects. And it's going to have generators, well, S, that sends an arrow to its source, or its domain, uh, an arrow T that sends an arrow A to its uh, codomain, or target T, um, an arrow that picks out the identity map on each object, so from O to A, and then the composition operator that takes in two arrows and puts one out, so spits, spits an arrow out. Um, and it's very important that the composition operator is uh, partial in this formulation because we can't compose any two arrows. We, we can only compose them when they have the same, the sort of matching uh, start and end points in the appropriate way. And then the equations we need for the theory of categories are um, sort of, they come in a few parts. And the first part is up here in the upper right, uh, which is talking about the domain of definition of each of our operators. Um, so the domain of definition of source and target and identity is just the whole, the whole domain because every object has an identity map and every arrow has a source and target. And that's what these equations here are insisting. And then uh, the domain of definition of our composition operator, well, it has to be the part of its sort of domain, its source, where the target of the first thing I want to compose is the same as the source of the second thing I want to compose. Uh, and we can do that equationally using our sameness operator in combination with restriction. And that's what you see here where my mouse pointer is hovering on the right of the screen. And then we ask for the category axioms. So the, the other ones, we ask that uh, composition is associative, that um, if I compose, no, sorry, that the source and target of identity maps are the object that they are the identity map on. And that if I compose something with the identity map of the appropriate type on the right or left, then nothing happens. <clears throat> um, Models, of course, are small categories. It's, it's important that they're small categories because they're models in sets and partial functions. It's okay though. And um, model morphisms, um, say if my, the carrier of one of my models, the, yeah. Oh, yeah, is uh, a model morphism is a functor. Um, so why are model morphisms functors? Well, what does it, uh, Sorry, <laughs> the, the thing that it means to be a model morphism, if you work it out, is that um, F preserves the source and target maps and identity maps on the nose, just as you would for a functor. And just like for our partial monoid operation, um, we, we get that sort of this inequality holds. And, and if we sort of squint at it a little bit, we can read it as saying that if F and G are composable, then so are f of f and f of g, and further f of f composed with f of g is f of f with composed with g. 
Um, where again, the reason that we need this to be an inequality and not an equality is that uh, we don't want um, f, f of f composed with g to always be the same thing as f of f composed with f of g, because there are situations when these aren't both defined, if that makes sense. Uh, and so in that way, we can capture categories. And um, you know, the, the category of small categories, in fact, as a variety, or sort of a partial variety, a category of uh, models and model morphisms of a partial theory. And uh, the last thing we'll talk about briefly is um, the, this variety theorem that we've proven, which is sort of uh, the, the big result, I guess, in our paper. Um, and the big result is that the categories that you can get as models and model morphisms of these partial theories are exactly the locally finitely presentable categories, uh, which, which are a thing that people study in categorical algebra, so it's very exciting. And um, in particular, it's exciting because it means that the expressivity of this framework of partial theories with our string diagram terms is uh, equivalent to the expressivity of finite limit sketches, which are another approach to what turns out to be the same thing, and also equivalent to the expressivity of essentially algebraic theories and many variants on essentially algebraic theories. And uh, this is exciting because um, our our notion of terms and the notion of sort of theory that it permits is uh, pretty nice, where for finite limit sketches, you have to work with uh, the type theory for categories with finite limits, for example, or for essentially algebraic theories, you have to work with terms and equations. And then there are a number of ways of expressing constraints on the domain of definition, but they're all a bit complicated. And uh, or at least to me, they seem a bit complicated. And uh, we, we think it's quite nice to be able to work with just generators and equations between sort of monoidal category terms on those generators to specify the, the partial algebraic theories. And, and we know because of our variety theorem that by doing this, we can get all of them. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I wanted to tell you about today. Um, if you're still here, thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoy the rest of Popple. Please feel free to ask any questions you might have um, in whatever forum is provided for this. Um, if you're interested, I encourage you to take a look at the paper. It's, uh, it'll be on archive if nowhere else, just search for the title. And uh, yeah, I think that's the end. Thanks again very much. Just let me close the video.